thank you all for coming. I'm going to get off the stage and let my good friend, who's and really is my good friend. We've been we've been friends for a long time now, oh, more wow. more than a de about two, almost two decades, not quite, but yeah. We met online in a time when neither one of us knew how to negotiate with people and learn how to talk to each other and have just had fun. And I'm glad to drag him out everywhere. Um, uh, without further ado, my good friend from Ari, Art Adams. Hey, hey. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, can we, are we able to get a little light off the screen? Just so it's easier, so this is just the lighting setup? Ah, okay. Good luck to you all. So, yeah, someday I'll, I'll write my memoir and it'll be my life in PowerPoint because that's how I do it these days. But I used to be a DP. I shot a lot of commercials and corporate uh, projects. Uh, started out in film and features and TV and then kind of moved out of the LA area. Um, fell into the smaller stuff. But um, I was always interested in learning how the tools I used worked. Uh, so I had a blog for a while, and I got really deep into a lot of this stuff. And then that kind of led to a job at Aerie. And then when the new camera came along, they said, well, you used to test all this stuff. So we're giving this camera to you. So I've been working with it for about seven or eight months. Uh, I know a certain amount about it. And I've got a lot of information to share with you. So I'm going to start. So that's me. If you ever have any questions, Lenses at area.com. I'm technically the lens specialist, but you know you can talk to me about the new camera too. If you have any questions about actually anything Ari does, I can find someone who can help you if I can't help you myself. So there's the new sensor. First new sensor in 12 years it was a big deal because we started out with very large photo sites, which is really useful for keeping the signal to noise down. Uh, and helped considerably with the dynamic range that we've been able to deliver. Part of it also is that we have simultaneous dual gain. You've probably heard of cameras that have dual gain. Well, they're doing one gain at a time. We're doing two all the time. So each photo site has a high gain that uh, amplifies the, the shadows and a low gain that pulls down the highlights. And then we merge those images in real time. And that's the only way we can give you the overexposure latitude that we do. It also means that we're always pulling out twice the data that anyone else is for the same resolution. So this is a 4.6K sensor. We're pulling 9.2K out of the back of the sensor all the time. It's a pretty big deal. But the other thing is that to make a Super 35 sensor with the same basic resolution as the Mini LF, the photo sites had to get smaller. So that was the first time we did that. When you do that, the noise level comes up. And that affects everything, including color, dynamic range, everything. So it took a while for the image science team to get to the point where they were happy. Uh, and this is, this is where they landed. And it's a really good sensor. So dynamic range, we've always had, hopefully you can see past me. Sorry, there's nowhere for me to hide. But um, we've always had the best overexposure headroom. The Mini LF had 7.8 stops over middle gray at 800. We now have 9.3. Uh, this beats film negative. Uh, the closest, next closest camera I know of gets about six. And I've been told that unless you build uh, the photo sites the way we do, it's hard to get anything more than that. So this is something we've done from the beginning. And if you think about film, we came from a film company. I mean, we, we made film cameras, but we also made film scanners and um, you know, laser output devices. Uh, so we got to know film really well. And film has multiple emotion, emotion yeah speed layers for each emulsion. So for like each color layer, you'll have at least one high speed layer and one low speed layer. So this kind of comes out of our film heritage, if you think about it. But this is the distribution here. Uh, basically, the dynamic range distribution shifts the same way it did with the Mini LF. Um, the lower you go, uh, you lose stops at the high end, but you gain at the low end. And on the high end, you, uh, you gain at the high end and lose on the low end. Uh, at 6400, you don't, don't gain any more high-end uh, latitude just because you're, you're kind of hitting the edge of what the ADD converter can do, but it works just fine because you've got 11.4 stops at that point anyways. So uh, I'm not the trusting type, so I actually did my own test, and this is what I came up with. So that's a Xyla. It's a 20-stop dynamic range chart. The idea is you clip the top step, and then you start counting down until you reach the noise floor. We stop counting when the signal noise reaches about one to one. So there's the, dis there's the distribution. 
Uh, you can see this stop 17, it's still about 2 to 1. You can still see, you know, if the, the screen had less light on it, you can still see a couple steps down there. But that's down in the noise. We don't really consider that usable because if you're trying to get at that, you're pulling up the noise floor. So, uh, so we stopped counting at 17. But it's all there. Uh, and that's basically where we stop counting. You can sort of see something here at the bottom. Uh, there's a little bump, but it's, it's so minimal, we don't consider that usable. So uh, here's a little demo we did from one of our Encounters films. We, we shot, I think it's 11 Encounters films. And the idea was we sent cameras around the world. And in each region, they had to come up with a story where two people, or I should say individuals, because one of them was a person and a horse. but you know, they meet and their lives change as a result. So this was uh, the UK team. Uh, when they told us they were doing underwater welding with a mermaid, we thought they were nuts, but they actually did it. It looks really good. If you see it online, I recommend it. Uh, but this is an example of what we have. So here's the Rec 709 grade. Just looking at the highlights, we're still holding the highlights really, really well. And also, red is a color, uh, I have an example later, but red is a color that we've had a little trouble with in the past. Our reds tend to go a little blue. It doesn't happen anymore. Here's the shadows. Lots of information there. And there's the log, log C4. It's a new log format. We're going to go into that in a minute. And here's false color. So you can see, you see my pointer works. Got a little bit of yellow. So we're within a half stop of clipping there, but nothing is actually clipped. Um, it's a little washed out, but there is some blue down here, so we're within a half stop of uh, hitting the noise floor. But otherwise, everything is holding. It's really impressive. All right, so one thing I'll touch on really quick. Uh, this camera is really developed for high dynamic range, and we discovered that we had to come up with a new PL lens mount for this camera. So it comes native LPL, which is our new universal standard. We give it away. Uh, we hoping every, hope everyone adopts it because it lets you put any lens on any camera and it doesn't care, matter what the, the sensor size is. Super 35, large format, doesn't matter. And it also allows for some optimization in lens designs. So if you're interested in that, come by. I can talk your ear off about that. But what we discovered is the LPL mount is really well optimized for stray light. The PL to LPL adapter is as well. But our old PL mount isn't as good as it needed to be with this camera if you're going to shoot something with 9.3 stops of overexposure latitude and you want to have nice deep shadows uh, in HDR. So we had to come out with a new uh, PL. Actually, this, there's a whole range of them. But So these are already optimized for stray light for the new camera. And then these are the new ones. So you could technically take, say, a PL mount off a Mini or an Amira and put it on this camera. It'll work until you get into an extreme situation. And if you're doing a feature or a TV series and you look at HDR down the line, the shadows may not be as clean as you might like. So strongly encourage, if you want a native PL mount, uh, get that one. So uh, we have gone up to 6,400 on this camera. In the past, we only went to 3,200. It's a really clean camera. Uh, we have an enhanced sensitivity mode, though, that makes it even cleaner. So. What this does is, if you're shooting at 24 frames a second, you have basically two 1 48th of a second slices. And traditionally, you use, you use one of those. So with a 180 degree shutter, your exposure is 1 48th of a second at 24 frames per second. We take that second 1 48th slice that's not being used, we compare the two, we look at the differences and try to detect where the noise is, and then we subtract the noise from the second image out of the first image. And it makes it a lot cleaner. Now, there are some limitations. Your maximum frame rate uh, will drop in some cases because, say, if you could do 120 before, now you can only do 60 because we're using that extra frame. Uh, and also, you can't go wider than 180 degree shutter or you'll be cutting into that next frame. But otherwise, it, will, it works really well. In some of the early firmware versions, if you were doing something like panning past a fire at night at 6400, and the fire is moving and the camera is moving, you might see a little bit of a double edge. Uh, they've been working on that. Uh, the new firmware, we, uh, we haven't loaded the final firmware into our cameras yet. Uh, probably in the next week or two we will. We're expecting to see massive image improvements. Because one of the things they told us was, while well, the demo cameras we have now, once the new firmware is in, we have to do a completely new sensor calibration, which takes about three hours per camera. And after that, they should be really, really nice. They're nice already, but we're expecting even better things. So 
there is some interesting stuff that I can show you here. We haven't, well, actually, it's going to be hard to see. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> what, I'll, what I'll describe to you is, and if you want to come over, I can show you. At 6400, you're going to see some noise. With the ES mode, you're going to see less noise. And now we have a function called textures, which I'll go into in a little bit. But this one texture, uh, there's a shadow texture and a deep shadow texture. And what they do is they take the color out of the noise at the bottom of the exposure curve. And what that does is video noise is very distinctive. You see a lot of color, like speckly green and magenta and stuff in there. And that texture will take that color right out. So now it just looks like film grain. And briefly, my colleague over here who's trying to sneak by uh, threw the camera into black and white mode because we have the look library in there now. We had to take it out for the mini LF, but we put it back in for this. He pulled up a black and white look at 6400 and it looked phenomenal. So now I'm real, I want to go shoot black and white with this camera like you wouldn't believe. So, but yeah, you would, you would see that here. So, uh, so let's see, this is about the fire. Um, if you go and look at this online, this is the UK Encounters film, it's on our channel. And it looks really nice. They did shoot this at 6400 ES. And the final is just very, 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 very clean. And it's, it's a beautiful shot. And they, they shot this whole scene on the beach lit entirely by uh, firelight. And you can see the light lighting them. And then you can see the flames. And the flames still have color in them. It's really pretty impressive. All right. So this is one of the things that I find the most exciting. We, re, we rewrote our color science. The math is completely different. We're doing stuff inside a camera that has never been done before in terms of color. It's a completely new color model. And the color is really, really accurate. So we have a new name for it. And I'll go into specifically what's changed uh, in a, well, over the next 20 minutes or so. But the colors are really, really accurate to the point where I can, I can look at stuff by eye and look at the monitor and, and the colors match. In fact, we did this in a conference room in the Erie building. We had the camera up there for a sort of like advanced demos for some of the big rental houses. And just by accident, we had a bunch of soda cans or uh, sparkling water cans that we laid out on the conference room table. And they had all sorts of crazy colors that normally cameras can't handle, like cyans and weird you know, greens and magentas and things like that. And when we took those cans and we photographed them just using light coming through the window and put can, uh, cans next to a Sony X310 monitor that we had in the same space, it's an HDR monitor. If we match the exposures, the monitor and the cans next to the monitor looked exactly the same, which is pretty impressive. I've never seen that before. So there's certain colors like cyans and burgundies and weird in-between colors that other cameras will throw one way or the other. And this camera, it just picks them up. So we'll go into more of this. Uh, but basically, um, yeah, let me, let me move on. There's more interesting stuff. So camera-specific features. You will be able to use the new color science with um, Airy RAW files from older cameras, like the Mini LF and the Alexa LF. Now, what you won't get is the stuff that happens in the camera. So you won't get the dynamic range, and you won't get the textures, because textures are right now available only in the cameras. Uh, the post tools need to do a little bit of a rewrite before they can handle textures and post. So until they catch up, we have to do it in the camera, and it is baked in. Honestly, a lot of DPs are saying they really like that, because especially in commercials, which is where I used to live, the footage would disappear at the end of the shoot, and I would never see it again until it was on the air. And then I'd say, oh, that's what they did with it. You know, it's nice to be able to bake something in that's yours, and this lets you do that. Uh, there's also something called advanced color match. Um, before, we thought of our cameras as, as more filmic cameras, so they would match, but there were little differences in the color of the filters in front of the sensor, and that wasn't a big deal until people started lining up three or four cameras on a set and using OLED monitors. And then those little differences became more obvious. So now with this camera, we have this advanced color match where all the cameras are matched at the factory and they should look exactly the same on set. I mean, you're going to color grade them anyways, but directors don't always understand that. Producers don't always understand that. And yeah, it's a little disconcerting to see two of the same monitors and see slightly different color. So that's not going to happen anymore. Uh, and then the rest of this color chain is what we can do in post. So we have a new debearing algorithm. It's so good that we have had people who shoot uh, projects for IMAX 
interested in this camera because this camera at 4.6K picks up details that some other cameras at higher resolutions don't see as well. And it's really interesting. And as far as I can tell, it's this new D-Bear algorithm. So it's really exceptionally good. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's, it'll be interesting to see how this looks on mini LF footage. Because right now, the new camera captures more details than a mini LF. And I'm guessing that once we apply this to the mini LF footage, we're probably going to get the same results. I haven't seen that yet, but I'm really optimistic. Now, you're not going to be able to get reveal color in a mini LF because the processing power isn't there. We came out with the Alexa LF. It was a 24-volt camera. Um, we had a lot of complaints. So when we came out with a mini LF, we tried to make a 12-volt. And we just couldn't do as much. And this color processing requires a 24-volt camera, which is what we have in the Alexa 35. It's a really good processor. But the mini LF can't keep up. All right, uh, more accurate color reproduction. I mean, I, yeah, I kind of talked about that. Um, I have a slide in here. I'll show you the color saturation. Actually, let me just move on to that because it's more interesting if I just show you. Now, one thing we did do, uh, you've probably seen a lot of these diagrams before. Uh, if you look at what, oops, there it is. Um, a lot of the times you'll see these, these primaries kind of out in invisible land. I mean, that's outside uh, the, the visible human spectrum. Our old color palette or gamut used to be, I mean, used to have be more way out here and way out here. And it's because uh, the way we used to do things is the way a lot of manufacturers do things. You have to kind of stretch these primaries out to get the colors that you want to look right into the right spots. So you kind of had to overshoot. And this is just a mathematical point in the color spectrum. We're not actually capturing invisible colors. We're just, our, our color model has to plot these uh, primaries farther out. But this new model lets us plot them just outside Rec 2020. So technically our new gamut is smaller than our old gam uh, gamut, but it's really, really precise. And that's a really, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, the colors that I see out of this camera, I've not seen out of cameras before. So this is another difference. Uh, we rewrote the log C curve. Previously, we had log C3. Now we have log C4. We had to do this because we have more overexposure latitude than we did before. And we had to change how we did things in order to preserve that. Because your eye is really, really uh, critical to gradations at, you know, in, in bright highlights. So to get this camera ready for HDR and uh, to be ready for whatever's coming, you know, 4,000 nit TVs, the HDR spec goes to 10,000 nits, so we may see that at some point. To make sure you didn't see any banding, we had to rewrite this curve. Now, the biggest difference that you're going to run into is that middle gray used to follow at, uh, fall at 38% on a waveform monitor. Now, in Rec. 709, middle gray falls at 40%. So if you toggle into log C to take a look, your midtones will look roughly the same. It'll look a flat, like a flat image, but it'll look roughly OK. The new log C curve puts middle gray, I don't know, a stop and a half lower at 29%. Now, functionally, that doesn't make any difference because this is a storage format. You're not supposed to look at this anyways. But if you're working with a DIT who toggles into that mode and looking to see how the exposure is doing and they panic because it's too dark, it's fine. That's the way it's supposed to be. Now, there's plenty of steps at the bottom there to handle all that information because we never let you record less than 12 bits in ProRes. So there's more steps per stop than in the original entirety of our log C3 curve. So plenty of, you know, plenty of code values there for all your information. The new Airy RAW is, is now 13-bit. It used to be 12-bit. Adding that extra bit doubles the number of code values. So tons of information under the hood. So you can sort of see the difference there. But if you're looking at log, this is what you would see. You know, on the right, the new log C4 is going to look a little bit darker. Run it through our LUT or grade it, and there it is. And it's just fine. And what's interesting is that with the new color science, I can actually see more detail or more uh, tonal variations in the specular highlight inner skin, which is really interesting. Now, if you put the Alexa 35 next to a mini LF, they are not going to match color-wise, because the new color is much more precise than the old color was, even though the old color was really good. So you can make them match in post, 
but on set, like I said, the processing power isn't in the mini, you know, in the mini LF. And you won't get the textures and you won't get the dynamic range, but the color can match. OK. So we do have a lot of uh, some new LUTs. Um, I just saw the version 1 LUTs that have come out. We've been doing a lot of experimenting. They look really good. I strongly encourage people to grade through the LUT because there are a lot of people who try to freeform it without using a LUT. Doesn't work so well with this one. And part of that is because of that log C curve. So in the past, you'd end up with middle gray roughly where it's supposed to be. And then for Rec. 709, you would pull, you'd, you'd increase the gain, you'd pull the shadows down, you stretch it out. And by pulling the shadows down, the saturation comes up. So you're forcing a color, this color space transform out of footage that wasn't really designed to work that way, but it would work. Uh, the new log with the middle gray at 29%, you can't pull it down far enough to get the saturation up. And the colors don't track perfectly because this camera is really sensitive to variations in color. I, I've even seen, we've shot some stuff in stadiums at, like we, we had a camera at the Super Bowl last year. They were, you know, for some tests, we've done, shot uh, some rock concerts. And sometimes the overhead lights or the stadium lights, if they're mercury vapor versus uh, LED, um, on an older camera, you may not see the difference so strong strongly. In this case, the colors do actually track differently, more like what your eye would see. So, um, not sure where I was going with that, but basically, um, this camera sees a lot more and then the Mini LF will. And let's see, where was I? Oh, the, the log curve. To get the colors right, you really should use the, uh, sorry, the LUTs. And uh, especially if I went back to that log curve, you would see there's a, a nice long roll off in the bottom of the new curve. And if you just freeform it, you don't get that. So you're actually robbing yourself of some shadow detail. So uh, yes, log C3 LUTs cannot be used with log C4 images. Uh, you will not get accurate results. We've seen people try to do that. It does not work. So this is a difference. This is actually an exit sign in our, um, in our stage in Burbank. Uh, this is the old look. Saturated reds would tend to go kind of bluish. And part of that was because of that whole um, overshooting with the red primary thing. If you had a really saturated red, it would go a little bit too far and drift over towards you know, uh, blue. Uh, the new one is dead on. If I look at a monitor and I look at this image, uh, or I look at this sign just by eye, the colors appear to match, which is really interesting. Uh, this is the old. This is this is the, what we called it secretly inside the company before we had the new name announced. So that's why it says that. All right, and we're now allowing saturated highlights to be a little bit more saturated. So the old model was over here. Saturation would basically uh, stop increasing when you hit middle gray. And then uh, the brightness would increase, but saturation wouldn't, because that's the way print stock works. Now we're looking more towards the future, the way HDR works, where you can have bright saturated highlights. So if you like the old look, you can always do that in, in the grade. We're looking at putting a look in the camera that might emulate what that does. But right now, you're going to see more saturated highlights. Now, there's some interesting things that come from that. I have an example of a neon sign I'll show you in a second. Now, this color is a really hard color for cameras to get, this weird cyan. And I first noticed this when one of my Australian colleagues shot some test footage at Bondi Beach in Australia. There's a, there's a pool there. And he shot people swimming in the pool. And the color of the pool, that cyan paint, was dead on. I never knew that was a memory color until I saw that image. And it looked really good. And I realized I'd never really seen that reproduced well before. So we were up in San Francisco for some meetings. We brought one of the, the first test camera we had. And we shot this because there's a lot of really subtle color in here. Like you know, the difference between this these two kind of putty greens. This is more of a mustard. Uh, this kind of yellow, this, this kind of subdued red. And especially this deep, saturated blue. These are all colors that other cameras tend to have a little bit of trouble with. And here, they're pretty much dead on. And they were dead on on an, on an overcast day. I was not very optimistic about this shot when I shot it, because we just jumped out of the van with a camera, grabbed it, and then left. When I looked at it later, I was really surprised at you know, I, I don't know that these are the colors the way they actually were, but what I keep finding with this camera is when I look at, at the color, the color, uh, the color is so subtle, uh, 
or there's there's finer steps or something that it feels right. I feel like this is what I saw because the colors do come through with a kind of subtlety that don't feel artificial to me. So maybe your results may vary. Maybe I'm making stuff up. Maybe I've dropped in the marketing mode. But for me, uh, this is something I've noticed over and over, and I noticed from the first images that I captured, and this is one of them. Uh, we also found that at, uh, at night, if you shoot neon, you can actually expose for the surroundings, shoot wide open. This is T18 on a, uh, a Signature Prime at 3200, 6400, hadn't been enabled yet, and I'm still holding color in the green neon. This is you know, out of range, so you still get the same kind of roll off that we had in the previous look. It's just farther up the scale, so it'll be the last stop or two. But you can preserve color in neon signs and use them to light a scene at the same time, which I've never seen before. All right. Um, we talked a little bit about this, how uh, this will be backwards compatible. And let's talk about sensor modes. So in this camera, sensor modes and recording modes are different. So there are multiple recording modes that you can get with a number of these sensor modes. And actually, this breakdown doesn't actually do justice because we actually have a 4.6K open gate 16 by 9 mode that is not full width or not full height. And my guess is that there's going to be a lot of people who are going to go for that because you can shoot 185 with that, get the full width, maximize your resolution. But there's a lot of interesting 4K modes as well. We're going to go into that for a se in a second. But this 3.3K 6x5 uh, mode is really nice because it's built for traditional anamorphic use, but it uses a smaller portion of the sensor. Now, the sensor's physical size is the same as the Mini the original Mini. And that was a little bit bigger than a lot of 35 millimeter film lenses were made for. So if you put an old like uh, 25 or 16 millimeter cook speed panker on, you might not get the full width of the corner of the sensor. Uh, and a lot of uh, anamorphic lenses are, they're, they're designed for a very specific frame size in 30, on 35 millimeter film that the Mini would exceed. So. Oh, and also, this 3.3K does give you the 8.29 megapixels that the streaming services want in order to be UHD compliant, and that's a big deal. Um, if we go full height, we can give you 12 megapixels, but you may have some anamorphic lenses that aren't going to work. So that's why we have this reduced red anamorphic mode to make sure that you're covered if you need that. Now. Talking a little bit about textures, we're going to go more into the recording modes in a, a little bit. I want to make sure I have time. I have time. All right, so textures, it's, it's a combination of about 30 settings that happen before the debare at a very deep level. We can sharpen the image, soften the image, we can add grain, we can reduce noise, we can take color out of portions of the image. Uh, there's a lot of really powerful stuff you can do. Right now, you're only getting presets. There's eight or nine presets in the camera. There's a default, which worked great for everything. And what we haven't told people in the past is there's always a default. Every camera we've released has had a default texture. It's just a tuning of the D-Bear or what's happening under the D-Bear that we think works best for that camera. With this camera, we have enough processing power to give you a lot of options, and that's what we've done. So the default works great for everything. Um, some of the textures are pretty subtle. Some of them you can see on a monitor of a decent size. Some of them are a little harder to see. So I recommend testing with a really good monitor or trying to project them. Don't try to look through the viewfinder or you know, on a 17-inch monitor on set and then try to figure out what you're seeing. If you're going to show it somewhere else, you know, bigger, later, um, you may be in for a surprise. So just take a look. I, I recommend testing them like, like film stock with diffusion filters. You know, shoot, you know, shoot some tests, look at them in a controlled environment, and say, when I go out and shoot landscapes, I'm going to use this. When I shoot faces, I'm going to use this. And then you're going to get completely predictable results. But if you just try to look at it through the viewfinder on set, it's not really going to work. So. There we go. Um, so we have a number of different uh, textures. Uh, at some point, we may allow you to make your own, but we have to simplify the UI because you can dig yourself into a hole really quickly if we give you full control. So we're not doing that quite yet. They are baked in. Uh, there are, there's stuff going on in the camera where the processor is act, act, uh, actively looking across multiple frames at a time like that ES mode where we're looking at two frames and subtracting noise from one from the other. 
Um, so because of that, the textures are baked in right now. Now, if the post software uh, you know companies start uh, allowing their software apps to look across more than one frame at a time, then we can make this metadata. But for right now, it has to happen in the camera. So it is baked in. And so when you look in the camera at the names, you're going to see a descriptive name that we worked on really hard to describe what this texture is going to do or when you might want to use it. But these are instructive as well because these give you a little bit of insight into what's happening. So this first letter is grain and it's basically the size of the grain. So our default texture starts with a K. It's kind of in the middle of the alphabet. If you go towards A, grain is getting smaller. If you go towards Z, grain is getting bigger. The next one, four, is the amount of grain that you're going to see. So this is, there's, there's, there's some going on in there, but it's basically the same as our default. Now for cosmetic, what's really important is contrast at fine image structures is really low. So this is going to be wrinkles and pores. Very small, you know, very small detail. And what we're doing is we're flattening the contrast. So you're basically not seeing the shadows as strongly. And when you flatten them, they tend to go away. And then the coarse detail, that's basically all the detail that you latch onto right away, like the eyelids and, and hair and things like that. The stuff that you expect to see sharp. This fine stuff, this is actually what film did really well, is it would show you this, but it would hide a lot of this. So a lot of film style lenses are designed to really punch this contrast, but then they don't do much here. So they still look sharp because you're, you're seeing that sharp contrast, but they're also very forgiving. So we tried to bring that to the camera. So these, this is default versus cosmetic. Here you can't see, let's see if on the close-up, you can sort of see right under her eye, you can see it's softer in this image. A little bit hard to see, but you know, this versus this. So it's pretty subtle, but that's the way our imaging science team works. They don't do things that are heavy-handed. They tend to sort of sneak stuff in there that has an effect, but you don't overtly notice. Uh, we have a, a cool filter. This used to be called landscape, and I really liked what it did to landscapes. And they were going to get rid of it because when they tested it at high EIs, it did weird things to the noise. And I said, no, 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 it looks great on landscapes. It's almost like you're at the eye doctor, and they said, do you like number one or number two? And number two looks way better. That's what this looks like. So they brought it back, but they made sure it, it works well with the, the, the high EIs, which is really nice. In the last nine months, we've had these cameras in the field, and I will notice stuff. Other people will notice stuff. We send it to Munich, and about two weeks later, something comes back, and it's fixed. It's actually been really impressive. Uh, this is the nostalgic. You're going to have a little harder time seeing this. This looks better in motion. Uh, actually, you can kind of see it. There's more grain. And then the contrast and the wrinkles is a little bit lower. So it just wants to feel a bit like, a, like an old film stock from the 70s or 80s. There's also a soft nostalgic that uh, makes things a little bit softer, pulls back on the grain, but then makes the wrinkles fade away a little bit more. We've got them all on the camera if you want to come over take a, and take a look. We have an X310 over there, so you'll see it really well. All right, so this is something important to, happen, uh, to keep in mind because we had this happen on a feature recently where uh, they wanted to take their, uh, their show LUT and put it in the camera because there were going to be times when they were handheld and they weren't going to have a connection with the DIT. So they just needed to feed the look from the camera. So the new look is different from the old look in that this look file would contain both a look and a color space transform. So if you're looking in the camera, you'll see ARRI 709. Airy default look for Rec 709 monitors. Well, now it's split. So we now have an ALF4 look file that just has the look. And then the camera handles the conversion. And the idea is that you should be able to build one look and then be able to send it out to Rec 709, uh, HDR, P3, whatever you want to look at, and have basically the same creative intent. So. Uh, that's, that was a, an issue with them because their show LUT was, uh, it had a Rec. 709 transform in it. We had to figure out how to unwind that and just make it a log-to-log -log LUT, which is happening here. Now, one of the reasons we did this is because post houses have been doing this for a while. So they want to make sure that the look is preserved 
even when display technologies change, all they have to do is come up with a transform for the display that they like and the look is still there. <laughs> and that's basically what this is all. So, you know, and they can use their favorite, this is, you know, post houses have their favorite conversion LUTs for whatever display transform uh, or display space they're, they want to watch in. Uh, we also have a set of uh, LUTs that you'll see in Resolve and Baselight uh, that will handle all of this. So if you're okay with our default look uh, and how we do it, then we've got this all covered. And you can control how much of that look you have. So you can basically dial it back to 50% uh, and let the log C transform, you know, the log C peek through so you can control saturation, you can reduce the contrast. So uh, it's an option that we haven't off offered before and I actually think it's really nice. Uh, c in combination with the look library, this could be really interesting. Before we, in the look library, we had three strengths that you could choose uh, between for contrast and now you can just choose your own contrast just using this. And the look library is back. Didn't have the processing power and the, the power capacity in the mini LF, but we have it now. So this is something to know about the drives. All the old media will work, uh, but when you first put it in the camera, the camera may say, we want, you know, I need to upgrade the firmware in the drive. There's a new uh, re uh, clip recovery algorithm in there for, you know, if the camera loses power, you can, just put the camera into playback mode and play back the last clip that was recording and it'll, it'll basically heal the clip so you can now access it. Because the clip has to be properly closed before any of the playback software will, will see it. So uh, that has to be updated. So any one terabyte drives that start with five or six, the serial numbers start with five or six, you're fine. If they start with one, you're going to put it in the camera. The camera is going to say, uh, your media firmware doesn't match what we want to see. Do you want to upgrade it? You say yes. It'll take a couple minutes, so you want to do it in the prep, but after that it should be fine. The new two terabyte drives should, um, should work just fine because they're brand new. Now, just so you know, these are not a cash grab. Well, a little bit of cash grab. But the reason we do this is because they have to be rated for throughput. Because, you know, we can't write to one SSD fast enough at 120 with, uh, you know, whatever modes will go up. I think the raw will go up to 75 or 90. Uh, I haven't memorized the table. You're going to see it in a minute. But basically, in order to get the throughput, while you're writing to, you know, you know, writing to the, one, the first SSD, you're already thinking about writing to the second one, and you just bounce back and forth. That's the only way we can get the throughput for, the, for anything that goes over about 60 frames per second in raw. Okay, I hope that's enough uh, recording formats for you. Uh, <laughs> I'll break them down really quick. They're not too bad. Uh, we've got, uh, as I said before, we've got sensor mode and recording resolution, and they're not the same things in every case. So here's uh, some examples. So open gate in Airy Raw, you've got the full open gate. You also have that in ProRes. Now, if you go to 4.6K 16.9, you can record the full width. Four, you know, 4,608 pixels wide, but if you go to ProRes, it's going to drop down to 4K. Now, this is a 4K 16 by 9 file. It's not a true DCI where it's uh, 4,096 by 2,180. We're giving you a little bit more height, but it's a, it's a true 16 by 9. Now, when you get down into the actual 4K 16 by 9 mode, you can record that resolution, or you can scale it down to UHD, or you can scale it down to 2K, or you can scale it down to HD. And you're using the same sensor window, you're just recording different formats. Now, if you get 4K 2 to 1, that is the same. So that's a, just a flat 2 to 1. Uh, that's the aspect ratio that uh, the streaming services are willing to compromise on if they don't want to. Some, some of the services don't want you to shoot full scope because they think the letterbox is too extreme for the average viewer, but 2 to 1 is OK. So that's now caught on. This is the 3.3K anamorphic mode that I was telling you about before that gives you the, uh, the megapixel count that the streaming services will accept. And that's the same in both RAW and ProRes. But you can also do a format where you actually record the unsqueezed image. Now, there may be a reason you want to do that. Uh, if you do, you drop down to about 7 megapixels, so the streaming services are going to complain, but there may be other reasons for that. Uh, and in this case, if you were just doing a film out, you'd be fine. Or showing it in a theater, you'd probably be just fine. 
Uh, and now we have 3K one to one. This is basically two to one anamorphic. So if you want to get the two to one aspect ratio for streaming and um, you know, keep the megapixel count up, uh, that's how you would do it. But and you can also do that in a flat mode as well. And then this is interesting. This is a, uh, a 16 by nine anamorphic mode. <laughs> so if you want to use an anamorphic lens and just capture 16 by nine, you can do that as well. And then if you want to exclude all the interesting parts of a person's face, you can use the 16 mode. So we'll see if anyone uh, uses that. It could be interesting. If you want to go for a different look and, and really emphasize the noise in an image, you can window it that far. Uh, if you have any questions, that's the email address for workflow questions. They're very responsive. They are working on Munich time, so typically it's gonna, you're going to get an answer early, early in the morning. Uh, but uh, they are very responsive. Uh, this is all the bit depth information. You'll, you'll find this somewhere. Um, I won't go through all of that, but like I said, 13-bit log, Airy raw is what we're using now. We did have 12-bit, and that's what you'll see in the Mini LF and the Alexa LF. So you won't actually see it necessarily is, is in terms of uh, what you have to set your software to to read it. It'll auto-select, but that is what's going on under the hood. And then like I said, we'll never let you record less than 12-bit in ProRes. It just won't happen. Uh, and we also took 422 ProRes out of the camera because for HDR it doesn't work at all. 422HQ is the bare minimum for HDR and that, that scares me. XQ is really what you would use in ProRes for HDR if you wanted the best results. Uh, there's a new MXF wrapper, blah, blah, blah. This is the important part. Um, in the file name, we're giving you more clip numbers uh, or more roll numbers, more clip numbers. Uh, we've always had the date. We're now adding the time of day. So if it helps you sort your clips by time of day, you'll have that available. We used to have the eye index for 3D, but 3D kind of gone away. So instead of right eye and left eye, we now give you A for Airy Raw or P for ProRes because the extension is going to be the same for both. And it's been an issue because you don't necessarily know whether you're looking at ProRes or Airy Raw. So this is going to help you out, hopefully. And this is fun because I didn't know this. I didn't know we were doing this. I always saw these weird letters at the end. And it turns out that's the camera serial number in base 36. So it's a five-digit camera number compressed down into either three or four uh, digits or letters. So it was pretty wild. You can actually convert that online if you go to Wolfram Alpha. It'll actually do it for you. Uh, updated online tools. We got a new frame line and lens illumination tool. So you can build your own frame lines and then bring them in through a USB stick. A lot of people uh, don't know about that because we haven't been very good at reminding people that it exists, but it still exists. It's been updated. We have a lens illumination tool where you can look at a bunch of lenses that we've actually captured images through and overlay your frame, line, frame lines on them and see what will cover and what won't. Uh, we've got the formats and data rate calculator, camera simulator, um, what's really interesting, and, and one of my colleagues in the booth actually has this, we have a new camera companion app where you can remote, remote control the camera uh, over Wi-Fi from your phone, and it's not the browser interface anymore. It's really solid. It looks great. Uh, not everything has been enabled yet, but there's enough in there, and it's really responsive that you can very quickly just change shutter frame rate, not have to touch the camera. So if it's on a gimbal or if it's on a steady cam, you don't have to worry about that uh, anymore. You can get to everything you need through that camera companion app. Uh, we have this new tool, which actually I think is on the next slide. So what this is, is uh, we used to have the Airy Raw converter and then we had the, where you would con do conversions to ProRes and other things. It was basically a QC set uh, tool. Uh, we had the color tool where you could build, look, and convert LUTs, and we had the metadata extractor where you could pull all the metadata out of the camera, and it's like 11 sheets, 11 sheets wide of Excel data. It's a massive amount of data. Uh, those are all now one tool, so that's coming soon. Uh, it's not publicly available, but it should be soon. We're on, I think, the last beta of this, and that's free. Uh, the new high density encoding tool, so um, you can compress Airy Raw now, but only during the first copy from the drive to uh, your hard drive. Uh, and you have to make that choice up front. The new tool will allow you to copy the Airy Raw and then apply the HD encoding to all your subsequent copies. So it's just something that uh, we've gotten turned on. 
uh, and this is actually something we also don't talk about a lot, uh, Airy RAW is actually a, an, ar an archival format. It's a SMPTE standard. So 100 years from now, if somebody has the white paper for Airy RAW, they can re rebuild all your footage. Um, that's not true of a lot of formats. A lot of formats are highly compressed or they're encrypted or you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, but I think we're the only one that's like a really a solid archival standard. Uh, and then these are all the tools that you're going to be able to see, uh, work with this in. Uh, I've been using uh, a, a Resolve Beta that's working really well. I've also tried Filmlight. Uh, that beta works really well. I know Adobe is working on theirs right now. I haven't really been in, in the loop on a lot of these other ones, but uh, they're all coming along. And hopefully when the camera starts shipping in probably two to three weeks, a lot of these will be ready. So that's pretty much it. Thanks for hanging in there. Uh, th those of you who are left should get a prize because that was a long presentation. But thank you very much. If you have any questions, let me know. I'll be over at the area booth or just down that aisle. So thanks. <laughs>